Lime Books present Overpopulation by Robert Salisbury. Episode 6 Confucius 1. Scene 6 Don't Jump. Coleridge had warned the few staff present not to come within six metres, or he would jump. As his ultimate boss, Banks felt obliged to speak. Come down, Carl. Please, step back from the ledge. Can't go on! Can't! Coleridge kept his back to Banks. Please, Carl, just look at me. There are no problems this big. Can't do it no more. I keep losing. Your losses are covered. You're not in any trouble. We need you, Carl. Coleridge screwed his neck around to look at Banks. Tears were running down his face. My review. Why did you say those things about me? I... And words failed him. Banks recalled the review. Trading losses. Underperformance. Leaks regarding Mamadou and his recommendation. Demotion. He'd signed it. I'm sick of being screwed over by the system. I tried, Philip. I really did. I know you did, Carl. Step back from the ledge. Everything will be better, I promise. Too many losses I can't pay. Coleridge turned away from Banks. I'm jumping. Carl, please, Carl. Think of your wife and children, Carl. Leone employed her most feminine voice. Don't talk to me! A gust of wind knocked Coleridge off balance. He flapped his arms and wobbled at the precipice. Everyone lurched forward, but he stabilised. He had cheated death a first time. Carl, I want you to do something for me. Take a gamble. Banks removed his phone. I'm calling the casino. Stake me all you have on one spin of the wheel. Win or lose. What? Give me your lucky number. Let me win something for those children of yours. You're playing me. Don't game me. No, I wouldn't do that. Are you liquid? Who do you bank with? Who? Barclays. Leone, get Barclays. Do ID on Coleridge. Leone is going to organise your proof of identity and then we can roll. If you win... Your problem's resolved. Banks stepped up onto the wall, a few metres to the left of Coleridge. Coleridge glared at him. What are you doing? Stay back! It's pretty fucking high, Carl. Banks peered at the street below. His head began to spin. He calmed himself and found balance. Leone confirmed she had Barclays online. Right, Carl. Tell them your details and we'll do this. Get your phone. Carl took his device from his pocket and swiped it. Yes. This is Coleridge. Yes. Debbie 87. Yes. Thank you. You done? Done. Okay. I have Mr. Thompson from the casino on speaker. Give me your lucky number. Between 1 and 36. No, put it on red. Red for Debbie's dress. You want red? Red. How much? How much you got, Cole? Two mil. Two million pounds. Did you hear that, Mr. Thompson? Yes, two million on red. You okay with this, Cole? Yes. Okay, spin. Everyone held their breath as Banks' his phone broadcast, the croupier sending the ball into the roulette wheel. There was some clattering noise, and then the croupier announced, 34, red 34. Yes! Carl, you've just won two million pounds! Coleridge remained calm and looked over the edge at the city streets. Come on, Carl, step down. You're four million. You're a superstar. You're on a winning streak. Come on, Carl. Coleridge 
thought of the home he wanted to offer his wife and family, but still could not afford. Again! What? You just won two million. Again or I jump! No! Cole, think about it. Four! All on red, for my children. No, Cole. It's too risky. I won't do it. I'll jump! Banks glared back at his staff. They were like frightened waxworks. Do it, or I jump! I swear! Coleridge turned to face the street and lifted his leg. I'll do it! Okay, okay, Coleridge, please. Mr. Thompson, you heard the man. Four million on red. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. Confirmed. Four million on red. Spin again. Everyone froze as the sound of the roulette wheel spinning came through the phone. Again, the ball could be heard, careering around the edge of the wheel, then dancing over the edges of each numbered slot. Eventually, it went quiet, and the croupier called out, Nineteen wins, red nineteen. Yes! Cole, you've done it! You, you're a legend! Eight million pounds! It's coming back, Cole! Let's get off this ledge! You've got that winning streak again! Coleridge exhaled and crouched, as though some great weight had been lifted from him. Then, as he stood, his shoe missed its footing and he yelped, Ah! His arms flayed about frantically until he regained his balance. He had cheated death a second time. Banks stood by his side with a steadying hand on his arm. They were now linked. He reassured in a quiet, low voice, Well done, Coleridge. Well done. Coleridge could feel Banks's left arm loop around his back, and he froze. They were now both facing air, with the safety of the rooftop behind them. In front of them was the city and a suicidal drop to the street below. Coleridge took his eyes from the street and raised his head. He traced over Banks's chest and chin and moved slowly up the length of his nose until he met with those steely blue eyes, those smiling eyes, the eyes of his boss, who knew everything about him, everything. It was you who introduced Mamadou to Vitellius, wasn't it? Coleridge began to shiver. He shot a glance at the street below. His feet shuffled at the edge of the wall. You took pity on her, didn't you? No. There was a desperation in his voice. You betrayed us. No! He felt trapped. No! His whole body began to shake. Banks gently nudged Coleridge in the back of his arm. Coleridge was pushed forward, but managed to maintain his balance. His eyes bulged from their sockets, and the street beneath him appeared to zoom in closer. You know how this ends. Suddenly, Coleridge twisted away from Banks, and Rugby dived, as if making a try to the safety of the rooftop. As he did so, Banks was pushed away from him and fell backwards onto the wall. Unable to react in time, his back and skull broke his fall. Instinct took over, and he rolled and clawed his way from the wall to the rooftop. Both men scrambled to their feet. You push me! screamed Coleridge. I saved your life. You pushed my back. You were going to kill me. I risked my life for you, you idiot. Well, I'm not working for this firm ever again. Fine. I'm taking my eight million and bugger off. What eight million? Coleridge froze. You didn't think that was real, did you? Coleridge began brooding. He snorted contemptuously. You cheated! Carl, I couldn't see you. Ah! Coleridge charged at the wall and leapt over. Banks closed his eyes. Could hear the sound of Coleridge screaming, diminishing, until there was silence. Banks opened his eyes. Members of staff were looking over the edge. He pressed his face into his hands and groaned. Leone approached and laid a hand on his back. It's not your fault. News of Coleridge's jump spread like fire through thicket to co-parties in New York, traders in Tokyo, 
satellite offices in Singapore and Hong Kong. For an industry with Chinese walls, unregulated gossip had a way of spreading. Banks did not stop to think on Coleridge's fall. He had things to do. Grief affects us in many ways. Its gestation may range from instantaneous to eternity. Death of one near raises thoughts of our own mortality. For some, its impact is as subtle as the waft of a butterfly's wing. For others, it is the tempest from an angry tornado. For Banks, it had yet to manifest itself. Scene 7. Brownstone, New York. I'm leaving you, Reuben. Reuben's wife of 30 years threw clothes into a leather bag. She was a little woman with a big personality. What? What are you talking about? Reuben stood in the doorway to her room. You never have time. It was her inscrutable values that had at first attracted him to her. They were now undermining him. He could hoodwink the Senate, the Fed, and joust with the best of them, the Ivy League lobbyists, the Washington Post journalists, but not Ida. One wink from her cynical eyebrow, and he felt exposed. What do you mean, I don't have time? Come on, I'm busy. You know what it's like with my job. I know what it's like with your job. You're married to your job. You never have time for Yakov. You never have time for me. What about our dreams? You said we were going to buy a house in Connecticut. What do you mean? We got a house in Connecticut. We bought it years ago. You have everything you ever wanted. No, we didn't. I live in Connecticut. You don't live in Connecticut. You live here in New York, in your brownstone, where you spend all your time. And if you're not here, you're in London, you're in Tokyo, you're in Shanghai. Honey, you ain't around. I ain't married to you. I'm married to your name. I never see you. And when we're together, all you do is eat and drink and fart and go to bed. Sleep a little. And then you rush off out. We are not married. This is not how I want to spend the rest of my life, Reuben. It's over. Look. I know I've been busy recently, but I can make changes. Let's go out together sometime. Honey, it's not about squeezing me into your diary. We're either a team or we're nothing. Oh, come on, baby. Don't talk like that. We've got to keep it together somehow. Come on, I love you. What are you, Barry White or something? You never don't talk romance all of a sudden? You're never with the children. What do you mean? I took Yak off to baseball last month. Yeah, and he said you were on the phone the whole time. You know, you're just not there. You may be sitting here, but you're somewhere else. Your mind is somewhere else. You may as well not be here. Where have I got to go that you don't got to do things? And honestly, Reuben, we got a life of our own to lead. Why can't you talk to Yakov? He needs to go back to university. Why does he need university, Reuben? We got enough money to last three lifetimes. He needs to get a job. What for? If he wants to be a designer, let him be a designer. Of dresses? Yes, of dresses. What's your problem? Didn't harm for a Saatchi, none. Why does he have to wear them? Just because you design dresses don't mean you gotta wear them. Oh, don't be a homophobe, Reuben. The boy's a good boy. My son, a dress designer, of all the positions I could have pushed him into. You gotta let him find his own way, Reuben. He don't need your money. Oh, he don't need my money so long as he got it. How much money you got in that bank of yours? Billions of dollars. And you won't even pay for his studio? Studio? He wants to launch a global brand. If he wants to be a dress designer, he's got to start at the bottom. Why didn't he stick it out with Yves Saint Laurent? The palms I had to blind to get that position for him. Sheesh! It didn't suit him. The boy's sensitive. 
something you wouldn't understand. Oh, it's my fault now. You know the good Lord ain't gonna look away, Reuben. You ain't speaking to that Rabbi Levi again. He's a good man, a wise man. Not like you, Reuben. Tell him I ain't donating no more. He's a fucking crook. Wash your mouth out, Reuben. He's got more in common with Robin Hood than Solomon. Takes my money, then drives a wedge between me and my son. Does he know Yakov's a faggot? That does it, Reuben. You are scandalous. I shake to think what Rabbi Levi will make of this. With her bag full, she marched towards the door. And don't go blabbing your jaw all over town. I ain't coming back, Reuben. The door slammed shut. Faggot. The phone rang. Reuben took a deep breath and picked up. Hey, Ruby, it's Yehuda. Where are you two? I thought you'd be here already. Oh, hi, Yehuda. I does not feeling well. We'll have to pass. Pass? You gotta be kidding. I get half Manhattan in my kitchen. Not to mention the best of the neighborhood around my table, expecting you two to make an appearance. Look lively. You say it's like this, Yehuda. Hey, don't it's like this to me, Ruby. El shavia has been scheming all day. I gotta put up with this for you to pass? Honestly, Reuben, if you don't get round here soon, I'm gonna jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, go fuck yourself, Yehuda. Reuben slammed the phone down. Scene 8. Leaves and never returns. Reuben's son finally submitted to his father's will and took a job at Morgan Sachs. He was put in the trading department on strict instructions to learn the ropes and not to expect any preferential treatment. A week in, Yakov had adopted a totally different persona. He'd abandoned the role assigned him and assumed control of his own team. In spite of his father's directive, no one dared to challenge him, and he took over the office of his immediate superior. Yakov had just finished in the gym when Tito arrived in his office. You wanted me, Mr. Segal? Yes, Tito, come in, sit down. It's about your team. What about them, sir? The figures are abysmal. Fixed income are beating you again. Fixington got twice as many traders. Don't be fucking clever. Your team is falling behind. Somebody ain't pulling their weight. Now, who ain't pulling their weight? I don't know, Mr. Segal. Yakov shot from his chair and stood up. Honestly, Tito, with figures like these, I want to punch somebody in the face. You know what I'm saying? I want to really bang their fucking lights out. You know what? Fuck. Hey, you know what? Get that lowlife loser mental in here. He ain't do no business. I don't get it. Yeah, well, I'm fucking serious. Get mental in here now. Now? Yes, you fucking moron. Now go get him. All right, all right. Cool it. Tito left Yakov's office. And as he did so, Yakov could be heard screaming, Man, I'm gonna fucking do it! Which sent terror across the trading floor. Twenty seconds later, Tito escorted new trader Menkel into Yakov's office. Hey, who's this? This is Menkel, sir. Menkel, right, yeah, Menkel. What are your sales figures like last week? Huh? What are, you, what are your sales figures? Come on, tell me, come on, come on, fucking spit it out, man! Uh, what, uh, month to month? I ain't got time to waste. Fucking tell me what you did last month. Sir, I, I did 383000 How did you settle alongside your competitors, huh? Huh? You topped the team? Your name on the trophy? You got a gold star? Where's your fucking badge, huh? Come on, you fucking nanus. What are you doing here? Tito asked me to... You are here so I can teach you a fucking lesson. Come over here. Get, 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 get the fuck over here. I'm here, right here. Stand here now. Shut your fucking face. Don't say a fucking word. Tito, take off his necktie. Tie his fucking hands behind his back. Come on, tie his fucking hands. Tito began taking off Menkel's necktie, but was reluctant. 
I don't know about this, sir. It's a, it's a silk tie. I don't care if it's a fucking silk tie. I'll buy you a new tie. Take his fucking necktie off. Tie his fucking hands behind his fucking back. Tito tied Menkel's hands behind his back. You got him good? Good, sir. His hands tied? Yes, sir. Can you move your hands? No, sir, replied Menkel. Now, fucking Menkel, I'm going to smack you in the face. Cause you're a fucking pussy. How much you earned last month? Hmm? How much you earned last year? Huh? How much? Fuck it. Come on, tell me. How much? How much? I, I've only been here three months, sir. Do you hear that? You don't belong here on that fucking table with those stars. They are superstars. Fucking masters of the universe. Who are you? You fucking failure. I'm going to pop you. I'm going to pop that punk face of yours. Yakov punched Menkel in the jaw and wrung his hand. Yeah, my fucking hand. He's bleeding, complained Tito. There was blood on the corner of Menkel's lip. What about my fucking knuckles? A little bit of blood? You ain't never seen blood before? Stand him up. Yakov swang again. Bang! As hard as he could into Menkel's face. Menkel groaned. Fuck, that felt good. Come on, fucking stand up, man, stand up. Do you want this job or not? If you don't stand up, I'm going to make sure you never work anywhere in this city. Stand up! Take your punishment like a man! Yakov swung up Menkel's chin. Blood splattered across the floor from Menkel's lip. Menkel shook his head and muttered, Boss boy! Beneath his breath, Say what, you fuck? Yakov punched him again and again. Bang, bang, bang. Suits rushed into the office and jumped Yakov, then dragged Menkel out of the office. Once Menkel had escaped, the suits exited, leaving Tito alone with Yakov. A smile spread across Yakov's face. Did you see me? They felt fucking amazing. Pop, yeah, fucking still got it. <laughs> oh, I got to do this more often. I got to do this every fucking week. No, every fucking day. I got to go on one of those losers in here, fucking pop them. This is the way, the way the world should be run. I'm telling you, we're fucking going to change things around here. I am telling you. Tito watched Yakov walk back and forth whilst ranting with excitement. Sir, sir. What? What? Minkel's father is senior partner Dresla Linz Heppelweitzer, sir. Yakov stopped in his tracks and covered his face with both hands. Images of his father surged into his head, the livid eyes menacing upper lip and the canine teeth threatening. He relived a lifetime of verbal humiliation, his father's disappointment thinly veiled beneath countless lectures. He knew he could never live up to his father's expectation. He did not have the, his diligence, his drive, his aptitude, his interest, his obsessive ambition. He was, as he had so often been told, a wuss, a loser, a deviant. He spent his upbringing consumed by jealousy for his sister, and her friends, dressed in their ballet costumes, dancing beautifully to pretty music. How could he explain? It had twisted and contorted his feelings, the concealment, the hideous affliction of his secret fetish, the box he kept beneath the floorboards. He felt as unloved and sour as an unripened plum, and no one hated him more than his father, whom despised all he loved. Why didn't you tell me? Tito sensed a mysterious pity for his callous boss, but was neither able to or inclined to offer him any comfort. Yakov turned through 360 degrees, crumbling like a sandcastle, caught by the incoming tide, shrinking from the outrageous Dr. Jekyll back into timid Mr. Hyde. His voice cracked. Why didn't you say? 
Tito felt the silence, like the hollow of the Grand Canyon opening up beneath his feet. Sir? All emotion drained from Yakov's face. He stiffened, and though Tito did not realize it, he reached a conclusion that resolved the dilemma of every haunting minute of his miserable adult life. I'm leaving. He picked up his jacket. You didn't see me today. He headed for the door. I never came in. Tito stared at the space vacated by Yakov. It appeared to wave a tattered white flag, like the end of an era. Yakov leaves and never returns. Yakov leaves and never returns. Yakov leaves and never returns. Scene 9. The Mean Streets of New York. Reuben stepped out of his office and his phone rang. It was Ida, his wife. Ruby, I was thinking, you know you talked about that boating trip you wanted to do? Let's do it. What are you talking about? Why don't we run away? Do all those things we always talked about doing when we were young. You can retire. Why are you still working, Ruby? Either I enjoy my job. Is that a crime? The cars on New York City streets honk their horn. But it's only money, and we have more than we could ever spend. The money's not for spending, Ida. It's for the future. What future? What I'm saying is, it's not the money, it's the game. Oh, you are like little boys. I got more money than you. Oh, look at me. I just made another billion dollars. Oh, honestly, Ruby, you are the only billionaire in Manhattan who drives a second-hand car. You wear your shoes you wore when I met you, and you got to go to McDonald's for lunch. I do not go to McDonald's for lunch. I was meeting Berkshire Hathaway. And will you stop collecting sugar sachets? Your pockets are full of them. Bethsaida said you ruined the wash yesterday. We got sugar, Ruby. I don't like to waste things. Uh, they're useful. Jacob uses them in his coffee. He doesn't drink coffee. What do you mean he doesn't drink coffee? He's a vegan. He's a fucking waste of space. Don't talk like that about our son. Where is he anyhow? I gave him a job and he's gone AWOL. I thought he was in Manhattan with you. He better not be hanging around with those Greenwich faggot friends of his. Ruby, you know what Rabbi said about your temper? Honey, I'm at work. Will you stop busting my balls? We need to talk. Not now, honey. Reuben hung up. He decided there and then that he would not be inviting Ida aboard Prosutagus. He pictured the new secretary in his investment department. What was her name? Twenty-three, blonde, long legs, big tits, eyes like a lost puppy dog, as dumb and innocent as they came. Yes, every cloud has a silver lining. Did Shakespeare say that, or was it Benjamin Franklin? He left the office. Out on the street, his car was waiting, door held open. He approached Shulman, his chauffeur, and stopped and looked at the sky. Lyrics from a song entered his head. Grew up in a town that was famous for a place of movie scenes. Noise is always loud. There are sirens all around and the streets are mean. He was taken back to his youth. A surly-mouthed, angry young man who once strutted the streets. A man who was going to make it no matter what. Sir? Shulman stood ready at the car door open by his side. You know what? I'll walk. Shulman was astounded. Sir? Reuben walked down the street. I'll join you, sir. Shulman then considered his car. 
He couldn't leave it. No need, Shulman. Take the day off. Reuben didn't look back. Shulman saw red. But, sir, you'll need me. I can take care of myself. Reuben thought to himself, Fuck yeah, I own these streets. He pulled his most conceited grin, for the benefit of no one, as he walked down Fifth Avenue. Shulman contacted the office. Mr. Segal, he's gone walking down Fifth Avenue. Shulman had to move the car, which was pointing up the avenue. After ten years' service, his perfect record was now under threat. Reuben took in the air. It was cold. He hugged his coat around himself. A beggar asked for money. He looked back at him, blankly, and continued walking. He looked at the rear calf muscles of an attractive woman, then up at the height of skyscrapers around him. The hard, busy expressions of men walking by, talking to thin air. And the lyrics continued in his head. If I can make it here, I can make it anywhere. That's what they say. Shulman saw his boss, his job, his pension, his children's future, his wife, leaving him. Segal was immersed in car horns, cabs and buses whistling by. He passed sellers on the street, smelt Chinese food. A couple swore at one another. She flung away his hand. He raised his eyes. He'll never make it. He continued walking. No one seemed to care. He had become anonymous. Shoppers with designer bags. People rushed, pushed, crushed across the avenue. Traffic stabbed forward, testing spaces. Drones above them carried deliveries. The rain increased. Wet pavements steamed. Hot air piped from vents in the road. Neon advertisements, peddled shows and cars and junk food, while a gaggle of twenty-somethings laughed and shoved one another, young and beautiful, using their own language. Tourists took selfies. A dog padded the pavement, weaving between a forest of walking feet. A passing car tossed food onto the road. He hadn't walked the streets alone in over a decade and could not believe that no one noticed him. No one asked his advice. No one sought his permission. No one asks him anything. They walked by ignoring him. Everyone, so absorbed in their own destiny, they barely glanced his way. Their eyes were blank pools, forgotten targets, distant horizons, far from his world. He stopped and allowed the flow of people to pass by on either side. It bemused him. No guard, no doorman, no assistant, no disguised agent to keep threats at bay, no safety net. He nodded, pulled an expression like Robert De Niro. He, Reuben Segal, CEO of Morgan Sachs, a U.S. shadow, worth more than everyone on the street, probably the richest man in America. His dick was sucked every day if he wanted it to be. It never happened, but if he wanted it, he could have it when and where he wanted, and never by anyone over 24. His suit cost more than most people spent on a car. His cufflinks were formed from solid platinum. His watch had belonged to Carnegie. His shoes were made in London by Lob & Co. His walls were hung with originals by Milo, Monet and Picasso. He had a handwritten note from JFK given to his father. Yet, no one noticed him. He stood outside 116th and looked up. He didn't see concrete, didn't see the offices, but saw only 48 stories of New York realty. $800 million worth. He gloated. He could buy it without finance, without due diligence, because... I can crush anyone who fucks with me because I'm Reuben Segal. I can arrest them, beat them, fuck them. They never conquer me. He had bought, sold, and merged corporations, set up sovereign wealth funds, changed governments, built revolutions, demolished nations, and deposed presidents. Yet, they didn't care. He had the power to kill, 
yet they walked on by without recognition. He outstretched his arms like the Corcovado, Christ the Redeemer. Hey, it's me, he proclaimed. Why does no one fear me? He could not understand and began to laugh. Someone bumped into him, knocking him off balance. Get a fuck out of the way, old man. Reuben was taken by surprise and stumbled to regain balance. He turned to see the back of a large man striding on by, without even looking back to acknowledge his mistake. Hey, get back here, he screamed. I could have you killed. The man stopped in his tracks. He was six foot four, as broad as a line back. Pedestrians noticed him now and made a wide space around him. Young women offered him angry expressions, drawing energy from him. What the fuck did you say, old man? Reuben's light diminished as the monster accelerated towards him. Before he could register fear, a sledgehammer of knuckles had dislodged his teeth and his feet rose up off the pavement. Blood flicked through the night. Blurry lights of neon span before him. He shrank to the size of a rag doll, his stomach pummeled by metal hammers, ribs cracked, lungs punctured. He flopped to the pavement, discarded like a used-up, squeezed-out coffee pod. He felt no pain, no remorse, no anger, but saw only the vision of his mother. She was preparing breakfast. You be a good boy, Reuben, she wiped crumbs from his cheeks. The sole of a large black boot crashed onto his face, stamping his nose like a metal press. He wondered if his skull had cracked, and if so, would his brain escape through the cracks? Another big fist crashed into his eye socket, causing his tongue to shoot from the back of his throat. His arms flayed about ineffectively. With each blow, screams rose, guttural exclamations, as the big man discharged his energy. No one came to his aid. No shulman, no bodyguard, no agent in grey to enforce inequality. His attacker had had enough. He didn't care for the consequences. No one cared. He would extract justice like he was juicing an orange, even if it killed him. Because this overdressed Wall Street pimp represented everything he had denied him opportunity that had crushed his dreams, his life, his future, had subjected his identity to every unscrupulous, unprincipled, duplicitous Janus face trick to denigrate him, his kind, his race, his people, and now he would do the one thing he did better than anyone else. He would fuck it up. They had destroyed his life, now he would destroy theirs. Another steel toe cap tested Reuben's stomach. Do your best, Reuben, his mother said. You fucking fuck! It was a penalty worthy of the Super Bowl. Reuben wheezed from lungs as broken as an old squeeze box, while the silhouette disappeared through the crowds. As he lay there, in his own feces, a sack of swollen bones, women bent over his crippled and bloody body with coos and delicate palms. They caressed his cheek. Don't move, baby. You gone. Ain't never come back. Don't you worry, none. When you get you fixed, somebody call an ambulance. You got insurance, honey? and the lyrics kept rolling through his mind. I got a pocket full of dreams. Baby, I'm from New York. Concrete jungle where dreams are made of. There's nothing you can't do. Now you're in New York. Scene 10. Operation Vitellius. Third move. Reuters office, Bond Street. Chief editor of Global News, Danny McQuirk, had assembled his key journalists, the cream team. Settle down now. The Chinese have denied that there is anything wrong with their batteries. And yet, we have just received this. The lights dimmed. 
Bodies could be seen drifting in a state of weightlessness inside a cabin of wall-to-wall grey and silver consoles. They were speaking in Chinese, in calm, measured tones. Suddenly, vision wobbled and the astronauts tumbled and span around, bleating frantically. English subtitles appeared on top of the image. The battery's gone, the battery's gone. Video ended. Lights came up. That was 23 minutes ago. News hasn't broken. I am informed that their onboard batteries exploded. Who's the leak? Glad to see you ask, Len. Bad news for the Italians. Spino is in Milan. Ready? Outside Vault of Spazio. Jennings, I'd like you to hook up with him. Nail Volta Spazio on their batteries. Lynn, monitor everything out of China. Ask questions. The moment they comment, I need to know. And people, send a Kate. I'll get on to Time Warner and the Beeb. Navian, I need a strap line. Oh, we could kind of like run with Beijing. We got a problem type angle. Good. Shall I like bring foreign press in on it? Uh, Nivian, what are we trying to do here, huh? McQuirk sometimes wondered if the present generation were too dim to be journalists. They lacked scepticism, with the exception of Lynn. Right, go, go, go. Fifteen minutes later, Nivian was watching his coffee pour from the coffee machine. Lynn stood by his side. You use milk. Almond. Large? Regular. My third this morning. I'm buzzing. Hmm. <laughs> Crazy story. Yeah, glad it's not me up there. My Chinese isn't perfect. I mean, I am not really Chinese. I was born in Newcastle. But, and Lin pulled her puzzled expression. Yeah? The translation. What translation? The subtitles on the leak, Confucius one. They said battery's gone. But but what? They didn't say that. They said we've been hit. We've been hit. Nivian twisted his face at Lynn. You're fucking strange, Lynn. Hit in space by what? Scene 11. Operation Vitellius. Fourth move. Lord Martin awaited the news. It's six o'clock and this is Idris Madaki for the BBC. Boom, boom. Pulsating music blared from the wall. Explosions aboard China's Confucian One threatens the lives of 13 astronauts. For more on this, our correspondent in Tampa, Florida... Leon Robinson. The screen changed to a head and shoulders shot of a suited man standing on a large, flat, open concrete runway in front of a big blue sky. Upgraded just months ago, the batteries aboard Confucius One are now at the center of this life and death struggle for 13 astronauts aboard the Chinese space station. Here with me is former NASA Head of International Space Communications, Colonel Manfred Hodged. The shot widened to include a middle-aged man in a plain jumper with a bushy brown moustache. He was Texan. You have spent considerable time in space. What do you imagine those Chinese astronauts will be going through right now? Thank you for having me, sir. I imagine that they will have procedures which they will be going through, checking things like a list. You know, life on a space station, there are always things to do. In the event of an emergency, they will revert to those procedures of which they will be very well rehearsed. I don't imagine they will have much time to stop and consider anything much else. Lord Martin stopped the news. The wall went blank. Hmm, something isn't right? Scene 
Scene 12. Operation Vitellius. Checkmate. Premier Xiaoping had been invited to Russia to attend a ceremony in his honour. He stood alone in the centre of the Great Hall in White Palace. Large enough to accommodate an Airbus A380, it was packed with dignitaries from both countries. Russians west of the line, Chinese east of the line. The red line being a carpet that ran down the middle of the hall with Russian guards standing along its length, Premier Xiaoping stood alone in the middle beneath the giant red pumpkin-shaped lantern which hung from the ceiling. The Chinese present regarded the lantern with deep suspicion. Lanterns should be hung in pairs to balance out the elements of fire and water. The Russians had built one lantern the size of a house and it was currently hanging directly above the Chinese premier. This made the Chinese nervous and questioned the motives of their host. The Russians sensed something wasn't right but were unaware of the cause. News of Confucius I had only just reached Zhao Ping. He was furious, but contained his fury beneath an impenetrable facade, which raised no alarm as the entire Chinese contingent projected an equally vacuous countenance. He was vexed because he had lost the deal of a century, the purchase of West African Water Incorporated, Warwinks, lost because he had put all his faith in a partnership with a stupid Italian who had put all their efforts into a fictitious computer character known as Mamadou. The deal had begun to unravel and the discovery that Mamadou had been deep faked. Their offer had lost credibility with some African nations. Then, even more disastrous, had been the Italian's battery technology which had exploded aboard Confucius I, destroying China's most prestigious project. Li Xiaoping was seen to be responsible. The plenary began to turn against him. They started with abandoning any deal he was involved with. That left the way clear for Lord Martin and Ruben Segal to move in and buy up the project. And worse still, Confucius I, was about to crash to earth in front of the entire world. He cursed himself for having relied on Vitellius, a man with no credentials. If Peter knew, it would be the only thing on his mind. He was about to appear. As the military band struck their first note, he would appear at the northern entrance of the Great Hall. He would begin his slow walk along the red carpet, his dodgy arm swinging awkwardly at his side and the only thing he would wish to discuss would be how on earth he had cocked things up. There was just a slim chance that Peter had not yet been informed. He had only just been informed himself. The brass struck up thunder. His backbone stiffened. Peter appeared at the northern entrance. The Premier glanced in Peter's direction. He knew. He could tell by the glint in his eye he promised himself before the day was done he would bury the Italian. Scene 13. Confucius I to Earth. Lord Martin had made a rare visit to Delange Martin offices, where he had summoned Billy and Banks to his private boardroom. There was a plate of pastries on hand and a large pot of tea. The windows had been blacked out and the news was playing on the wall. Well, this is fun. Boom, boom. This is Idris Madaki for the BBC. I'm here in the Indian Ocean where Confucius I is expected to hit any minute soon. Madaki just happened to be aboard a British ship in a safe location, yet close enough to the spot where Confucius I was to make impact. Confucius I is on her way! The camera pointed at the sky, but nothing could be seen. Chinese authorities still maintain there is nothing wrong with their batteries. 
The camera caught a silver speck in the sky and zoomed in. It grew to the size of a small train hurtling towards the ocean. Here she comes! Whoosh! It made impact with the ocean and created a massive flume of steam and ocean spray. The camera pointed to the sky to take in the mushroom cloud created. Madaki's face filled the screen. He employed a gentle, level tone. A very sad day for China's space ambitions. This is Idris Madaki reporting for the BBC somewhere in the Indian Ocean. The screen went blank and all windows eased to daylight. Tremendous! exclaimed the Lord. Billy cheered. You don't seem impressed? Banks looked sombre. This means we have war wings under our belt. There were astronauts aboard. Oh, don't be like that. We did not bring down Confucius I. Spiron did. Banks did not credit this with a reply. I have news for you, Philip. Tinai has found Zara. Really? Where is she? Oh, don't worry. She is fine. She is perfectly all right. But where has she been? She is safe. All will be revealed, but first, follow me. Banks looked about himself and checked his phone. No messages. The Lord left the boardroom with Banks trailing behind. They took the lift to the ground floor. They passed through security and walked into the street. Lord Martin's security swarmed around them at a discreet distance. Banks stared at the Lord, unable to maintain his patience. Please, my Lord, tell me where Zara is now. I will. I know you must be missing her. She is your sweetheart. But first, let me ask you something. Look at all these people. They were being passed by pedestrians, going about their business, unaware of who they were. Look at them. Businessmen, businesswomen, parents, young people, hundreds of them. And this is just one street. How are you going to look after that lot, hmm? The Lord prodded Banks in the chest. I want you to assure me that you will look after them, that they will be able to pay for their cars and homes and settle their bills. They cannot fend for themselves. They live in a world where their jobs and livelihoods depend on multinationals who have no loyalty to country or people. What on earth is he talking about now? Please tell me where Zara is. When you marry, you will inherit billions from Rashid, who I know has plans for you, which I will match. Furthermore, if I do succumb, I will see to it that the pair of you as happily married couple are taken care of. The Lord could see that Banks was unable to concentrate. He smiled. She is waiting for you at your home. Thank you, my lord. Please excuse me. Banks turned and fled. Before he could make the basement car park to find his car, his phone rang. It was Zara. Zara! Zara! Is that you? Philip! You have been listening to Episode 6 of Overpopulation. Next up, the final episode, Episode 7, Global Research.